So yeah, I'll, I'll repeat to you guys just something just quickly that I was sharing with uh, the Helps Ministry this morning. Um, and, and I was just talking to them about how, you know, before all this COVID stuff hit, how we, uh, we used to obviously have a time of singing, right, praise and worship, and then we would get into the message. But how the, that praise and worship time was kind of like, I, I, at least personally myself, I got used to it being kind of like our warm up right, where we kind of like warmed up and it just kind of got, got in the right frame of mind, sort of, right, and then by the time it was time for the message, you know, I, I felt, you know, you, you, your thinking's right, everything's good, um, but then it was interesting when, when that had to stop for a time, um, I, I kind of felt like, you know, like, like what's going on, something feels a little bit weird, and it's because we didn't have that time, uh, and and then the Lord, you know, just as he, as he always does, right, he's continued, obviously, to teach us. And you really see how you don't, th that, that's not something that you need, right? You don't, you don't need someone to jumpstart you all the time, right? It's, it's a good thing, right? It's a help to us, right? Church is a help to you. Your Bible is a help to you. Uh, uh, listening to messages is a help to you. Uh, listening to good music with good lyrics, right? That's a help to you. And just a little side note, right? Uh, some people have such a huge prejudice to types of music. Like, oh, yeah, I like classical music. I don't listen to that rap junk. But, you know, or people that listen to rap don't like classical or whatever it is. But to be honest with you, I don't really care what the type of music is. I care about the words in the music. That's what I care about. And most people are not like that. Most people listen to music, oh, it has such a good beat to it, and they don't even know what they're singing, right? I mean, I grew up, if any of you grew up like I grew up, right? You grew up singing stuff that you're like, this is like obscene. Like, I didn't even know I was singing that as a kid. Like, what, what was I even doing? Like, what was I listening to, right? It's just crazy stuff, and you just listen to it. And actually, half the time when I was singing in a car or doing something, I wasn't even saying the right words anyway. You just kind of sing what you think you hear. But the point is, though, that we, we don't need that constant, uh, and let me rephrase this. By need, what I mean is you're in lack and therefore, it's a necessity for you. That's what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying that it's not good. I mean, obviously, we have a church, right? We, we li I listen to good music all the time, right? I, 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 I listen to messages. I read my Bible all the, all the time. I mean, every single day, I'm, I, I, I reference something or I'm reading something or I'm doing something. But the thing is, it's different, though, when in my mentality, in my heart, my mind, I, I know what I have. I know I have the Spirit of God in me. I know I have the teacher on the inside of me. So I'm not going to a place where I get more and more dependent always on that if I'm not in a church atmosphere. So that means basically if you go on vacation, your mind is gone, right? That, that's what happens to most people. They go on vacation. They don't even know who God is on vacation because they're like in another world, right? But, but that's not how it is, right? I can, I can go on vacation. I can, I can just go away for a weekend. I can be working. I can be busy. I can be working outside. I can be working with my hands. I could be playing a game. I could be doing whatever I'm doing. And it doesn't mean that my mind can't be on him because I know that the place where I'm headed, right, the place where we're headed as God's children is that our mind will have have full knowledge of God all the time, 100% of the time, we'll be walking in the Spirit, quote unquote, right? That's actually what Paul says. Paul says, since you live by the Spirit, in other words, what he's saying is, I believe that's Galatians, but he says, or Romans, but he says, since you live by the Spirit, then, then walk in the Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is, you already have life by the Spirit of God. He's living on the inside of you for crying out loud. Why don't you walk in Him then? Right? Walk in Him. In other words, walk in what you have. Another way of saying that is, utilize what you've been given right? It, what you've been freely given. So, um, so, you know, and a lot of that comes to mind because we, we did take a little break. You guys noticed we didn't have service Sunday and Wednesday. We took a little break. We went away and it was, it was nice, you know, a lot of time with family and it was cool. But, but throughout that whole time, right, it was good. I mean, more than ever before, more, more, than, more than any years before, you know, it's so cool to be able to know, you know what, Lord, it's, I can have you in my mind, in my heart. You're teaching me. You're showing me things, right, all the time. And that's obviously the same for every single one of us. So it's just good. You know, I wanted to say that to you. So as we, we started to uh, just wanted to take a little time just to pray real quick before we got into the Word. And, um, but 
even in that, I want to just encourage you, right? Don't, don't just listen to me pray, right? I'm not praying. I, I can pray for you, right? When, when, you, when, you say, when you ask someone, hey, can you pray for me? What you're saying is, I believe the Lord. I have faith in Jesus. But there are just certain things in my life, right? We're all growing and we're all in different places, right? So because you're growing, you need that help from people from time to time, right? I need that help from people. So I, I, I can pray for you and I need people praying for me, right? But, uh, but, but the interesting thing is that if I pray for you, it's my faith in Jesus. If you pray for me, it's your faith in Jesus, right? But it's always someone's faith in jesus always it is always someone's faith in jesus things do not just happen right uh uh, you know i i um i've kind of grown to a place you know where i can more readily hear someone say a curse word than to hear someone blasphemy god i'd rather listen to that sometimes you know what i'm saying like like if i hear somebody say something say an obscene word quote unquote a curse word that's not very shocking to me but when I hear somebody say, oh, don't worry, God always has a reason for why things happen, that goes right through me. That, 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 that hurts. That, that's like somebody driving a knife in my mind. Like, what in the heck are you talking about? Like, because they think that God makes everything happen. God's in control of everything. If you get into a car accident, that was God teaching you something. If you got cancer, that was God make, making you lie flat on your back so he could get your attention. It's stupid ignorance, right? It's just ignorance, right? Stupidity is not knowing, right? So things come out of people's mouth because they don't know. God has never been in the business of desiring to, to speak to you to bring repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. God never, never, ever changes the mind of a person through making something negative happen in their life. And here's a big reason why. Because that doesn't work anyway, right? Bad things happen to you all the time and your mind is not renewed because of that, right? Never. People say you learn from your mistakes. That is hogwash, right? You don't learn from your mistakes. If something bad enough happens to you, you still want to do it, right? You just don't do it because you don't want what happened to you to happen to you, right? But when the Lord renews your mind, right, when when your mind changes, that's different, right? That is, you used to think this way, now you think this way. That's completely different. That's totally different. And only the Lord does that. And the only thing that brings a man to repentance. Listen to this now. The only thing that brings a man, an individual, a person to repentance is the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It is, let me say it even clearer. It is understanding what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross that brings you to love him. The Bible says that we love him because he what? Loved us first. That's what that means, right? That the only reason why you love God is not because he gave you cancer, right? The reason why you love God is because he loved you and gave you his son, right? In other words, it's, it's funny. We as Christians, you know, you hear someone curse around you and you're like, oh, I'm appalled. Please, can you not talk like that around me? But we would allow someone to say, oh, you know, God was just teaching me something. You know, let someone blaspheme God right in front of you and we take no offense to that. We, we, we see no offense when someone speaks against the gospel, but if someone were to say a curse word, that really doesn't mean anything. The majority of the time when people curse, it's the same thing as if they said darn, right? It, they don't mean anything by it. Now, there are times when you say something to someone and you want to hurt them with your words, right? But you don't have the curse to do that, right? You don't have to say the F word to me to, to try to hurt me with your words. You can say that very nicely. There are people that talk very nicely to you right? And they want to cut right through you with their words. So you, you don't need to say bad words. It's your, the intent by what you're saying is what is bad, right? That, that's what hurts. It's not the words that you use. It's how you're trying to cut some with what you're saying. So, so the, the thing to realize, you know, I, I want to go back to this, that just even as we get ready just to, just to pray for a second before we start, like, like let, it be, let it be a time, like if you're by yourself and, and you're like, you know what, you're doing dishes, right? You're doing dishes. You know what, Lord? I just acknowledge you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It, it just, I just did that right there. I got all goosebumps all over me. Just because all I thought, all I thought in that split second was just with this one thing. My God, everything that he did for me and look at everything that he gave me. Like that just went right through me. Like it makes you feel so good. Like you, you remember like, Lord, everything that you've done for me, everything that you've done for me. You know, what do you think works better with, with family members that don't know the Lord? Is it better to say, you know what, because you're a sinner and you're going to hell, what works better, that or 
letting them know what Jesus Christ did for them. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. But when people say you beat them over the head with the gospel, you're not really beating them over the head with the gospel because you're not really even speaking the gospel at all, right? Now, there are people that you give them the good news. You really tell them what it is that the Lord really did for them, and they don't care. They don't want to hear you. Well, that's fine. So then don't tell them anymore, right? If somebody tells you, listen, I don't want to hear what you have to say, then don't tell them anymore. But, it, but, but it's good, you know what, to know, like, when you, when, when you just take the time and you just acknowledge the Lord, it could be here, awesome, right? We encourage you to do that. We, we teach you to do that, right? In, encourage you in acknowledging God, acknowledging Him in all of your ways. But when you're not here, right, you're doing dishes, we mentioned before, you're working in the yard, you're at work, you're doing computer programming, you're, you're doing something very, very precise, right? No matter what you're doing, acknowledge God in that, right? Everything that you could do, he can do better. Anything you do, he can do better than you're doing it, right? So, so there's no need for me to acknowledge God in some of my ways and not in others, right? I acknowledge God in all of my ways, right? In all of my ways. Let's do, let's do that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, my God. We just, we love you, Lord. We thank you, my God, that we can be encouraged by people. We thank you, Lord, that we can be, um, that we can have people encourage us in our faith in you. Encourage us in our seeing you. Encourage us, Lord, in our faith in you. Faith is seeing. Faith is not, uh, not, uh, is not absence of knowledge. Faith, faith is knowing you, Jesus. Faith is knowing you, Jesus, knowing what you've done for us. Knowing, Lord, how you took our sin upon your body on the tree, how you became a curse for us. Thank you, Jesus. How you became a curse for us, my God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my God. Thank you, Lord. Good, good. Right? It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be short. Right? <laughs> I think we get caught. I used to think, oh, you got to pray a long time. Pray a long time. And then I read Pray Without Ceasing. It's like, wow, you're supposed to pray like all the time. Like you can't stop, right? But prayer is just you saying out loud the truths about the Lord that you know, right? Just saying them out loud. But it's for your benefit. It's not for God's benefit. You don't pray for his benefit. You're not praying so that God learns something, right? God already knows everything, right? You don't pray so that he knows he's living in you, right? Like sometimes people think that. Like I pray because I have to let God know everything that I'm doing. I think he pretty much knows what you're doing. He lives on the inside of you, right? His spirit is in you. So it's not for his knowledge. So if when we pray it's not for his knowledge, then who is it for, right? right? It's for you or for another. Let me, let me show you something. If we can go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. Uh, so Philippians 1, 19 says, For I know, this, this, is, this is Paul. He's been, he's under, I believe he's under house arrest, right? It just means they lock him up in his house and they don't let him out. Um, he wasn't in a cell, but he was a prisoner in his home, I believe it was, through this time. Um, it, it was either that or he was in jail. The point is, I think he was, he was being held. Um, in verse 19, he says, For I know, Paul says, that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So listen to what he said. So he's writing here. This is a letter that he's writing to the Philippians. So I don't know if he was in Philippi. I, I, I haven't, I, I'm not looking at, the, at, at where this started. But he, he's, he's going through something, and he writes to the church that is in Philippi, right, in the city called Philippi, and he writes to them, and he says to them, he says, I know that this thing that I'm going through, it's going to work out for my salvation. Now, that word in and of itself is a pretty interesting word, salvation, because what we say Right, where we say in Christian circles, are you saved? And what we mean by that is, are you going to heaven? So we think salvation means going to heaven, but that's not what salvation means. Because right here, he didn't say, I know that this is going to work out for me to go to heaven through your prayer. Because Paul's already, Paul already has the Lord, right? So he's not saying to the Philippians, oh, I know that this is going to work out for me to go to heaven through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit, somehow I'm going to heaven. So he's not talking about going to heaven. Salvation is not going to heaven, right? Beside the fact that we don't stay in heaven anyway, right? The Lord is going to rapture the church, but we don't stay there anyway, right? The Lord is going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and this is where we will be, right? But the church thinks, I don't know, that we're going to be playing harps or something on the clouds because that's what they see in the cartoons. But anyway, so it says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So, so he's saying something is going to happen. Something is going to happen, number one, through your prayer. That's somebody else. And through the supply of the Spirit of Christ, which is him. 
So those, those are two separate things, through someone else and through him. So something is, whatever he was going through, I believe it's the house arrest piece, he said this, this suppression of the gospel that they're trying to do, they're trying to hold me back, this is going to work out for me for my salvation through, it says, through, uh, through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit. So how is it that someone, right, let's say, let's say it's you praying for me. How is it that you praying for me, somehow something can happen, or through the Spirit in me, something can happen? So, so there's one answer for both of those, right? And it's what we were actually praying before. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ, right? When he says, when he says here, through your prayer, right? Prayer, we said, is what? Prayer is for you or for someone else? Right? It says the prayer of agreement, right? What does that mean? That you agreeing with someone else. But it's, it's you, what you're agreeing about is not grabbing someone's hand and say, okay, Lord, I know that this person is going to be healed. Because you can say that, but you're not agreeing that someone's going to get healed. You're agreeing that they're going to be healed because of what Christ did, right? Those are two separate things. Because, because if somebody says, hey, listen, can you pray with me and agree with me that, that I'm going to be healed? What people think that that is somehow is that if I get someone to pray with me, God is going to listen, right? That, in other words, what they think is that when I pray, I'm getting his attention. But you don't pray to get God's attention. Prayer is for you or for someone else, right? He said through the supply of the Spirit, which is in me, or through your prayer. So, so it was the church of Philippi praying for him, right? So the, the church of Philippi was not for God, for Paul, the church of Philippi was not to storm the gates of heaven so that God would wake up from his sleep and do something for Paul, right? Because God never sleeps and God never slumbers and God is always good and God is always perfect and every good and every perfect gift, right, has come to us already through the Father of lights whom, through whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, God never changes. God is always good. God never looks at you and says, you know what, today I don't want to be that good to you because I remember what you did yesterday. He is always good to us, right? Always good to towards us because what he has done for us, he has already given to us, right? So the prayer of the church of Philippi was for Paul at that precise moment, what he's making reference to. But again, and then he said, oh, through the supply of the Spirit in me. So, so what he was saying was, through, your, through you praying, right, and agreeing, so, right, what they were doing, well, they, they, were, they were saying out loud, uttering out loud, or they could have been praying to themselves, right? Prayer does not have to be out loud. Prayer can be, you can mumble it under your breath, or you can not say it at all and just say it in your mind. But it is for your benefit. You can pray for someone that is across the, across the world, right? You don't always have to be touching somebody to pray with them. You don't always have to hold somebody's hand to pray with them, right? They can live on the other side of the globe, and you can pray for them. But what happens is, what, what, I, I, I get it, right? We, we, we have this thing, it's, it's this funny thing, like it, it, you have to be able to touch someone. You have to be able to lay hands on someone. Do, can you lay hands on the sick and they recover? Yes. But your shadow can touch somebody and they could be healed, right? You, you, can, you can, like here, he is writing a letter to the church of Philippi. In other words, those people are not by him. And he's saying your prayer, were, let, let's say, I, I don't really know where this was, but let's say they were 10 miles away. Now let's make it better, two miles away. They were two miles away from where Paul was. So they were praying for Paul two miles away, and their prayer of faith, right? James says the prayer of faith will save the sick. That's not going to be about, again, salvation. In that example, save the sick, salvation there is, is, is synonymous with healing. So there you see salvation is synonymous with healing. Here, salvation is, is synonymous with deliverance. Salvation here is synonymous with working things out for your benefit, right? So here, Paul is not sick. He's not saying the church of Philippi is praying for him so he'll get sick. But here the word salvation is used. And in James, for someone that's sick, the word salvation is also used. So obviously salvation is, does not mean I'm going to heaven. Salvation means that you have been saved, right? Delivered, freed from it, right? Freed from it. You're, you're saved from it, right? We, we know what that means, right? If you're drowning and somebody throws you a lifesaver and you grab it, you're saved. You're not dying. You're not going to drown, right? But, but, but we, we've made the word salvation very small. But here, it, the example in James, right? The, 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 the prayer of faith, prayer of faith, right? The, the prayer that uttered in faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is never in a circumstance. Faith is always in him. 
Faith is always in him. You don't have faith that tomorrow is going to be a better day. You know that tomorrow is going to be a good day for you and the day after and the day after that and the day after that because all things work together for good to those who love God, which means have faith in Jesus Christ, right? That's what that means. Faith is only through Jesus. If you come to God and you didn't know anything and you said, Father, I want to have faith in you, you don't have the spirit, right? You're not saved. And you say, you say Father, I want to know you. He's going to send you to learn Jesus, right? It says, Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father except by me. He says, nobody comes to the Father except, he, he, except what he draw them. How does he draw them? Through the knowledge of Christ. Always, always. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. How do you know the Father? How do you know the goodness of God? Because you know Jesus and you know what he did. That's how you know God is good. Apart from Jesus, nobody knows that God is good. Apart from Jesus, if Jesus had not come, no one knows God is good. There would be no such thing as being in a church and everybody saying, oh, God is good all the time. You couldn't say that because nobody would know that. Even though today people say that and they don't even know what they're saying. They're saying God is good because they got a stimulus check. But that, that's not why God's good. God's not good because you get a check. God is good because he sent his son and gave you the power of wealth through what Jesus did, right? God is not good because you got money and a raise because you could be a Satan worshiper and you can get a stimulus check, right? So it's not, God is not good for those external reasons. God is good because of what he's done. Therefore, faith in Jesus is only on what Jesus did, right? So when, when he said here, he, he says, for I know that this shall turn for, out for my salvation through prayer, even if they were just two miles away. Obviously, you see, you can pray for someone that's two miles away, right? And because you, your faith, there could have been 100,000 people in Philippi praying. There could have been 10 people in Philippi praying. But if one of those 10 had faith, that's why it would work out for his salvation. Why? Because everything that you have been freely given, right, freely given to you, everything God has freely bestowed upon you, you can freely give. All of the power that God has given you to wealth, right, you can share that with people. You can, in other words, you can give, you, you, can, you can lay hands on the sick and you can see them recover. You can, you can pray for the prosperity of somebody in an area of their life, right? It doesn't mean that they can always receive from you like that because no one is going to be 24-7 uh, praying for one single individual. They, in other words, someone can't live salvation through you. They need to know the Lord for themselves. But you can pray for someone that they would be able, that they would prosper. You can pray for someone that they would be healed. You can pray for someone, right, for anything. Anything, in other words, anything you have received, you can share with someone, right? The, the, the apostle said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, right? As, as, as I have received, right, I give unto you, right? He, so in other words, what we have been given, we can give away freely, and it never depletes what you have, Right? The Spirit of God in you is not depleted because you lay hands on someone and they're healed. But, but again, if, if a prayer two miles away works, right, then you can pray for somebody in China, right? It really doesn't matter, right? It's not like the power of God is going and it's two miles, three miles. Now it's getting weaker, weaker, weaker. But we say dumb things like that. Like you have to, God has to send someone to China to lay hands on somebody that's sick. You don't have to be there. When did anybody teach the church that? That, well, it says lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Sure, you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, but you also don't even have to touch someone and they can recover. You can pray for someone for their salvation, right? For their salvation. So in this example, let me show you real quick again. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Right? So what he's talking about here is that he says, even though I know that, uh, and, and obviously he's acknowledging there, I don't know everything. Like Paul is saying that right here. In that little bit that I just read to you, he's saying, I don't know everything. Now, even though the church has taken, taken Paul and they, you know, a lot of denominations call him Saint Paul as though, you know, like you're not a saint, right? Ephesians says the inheritance that's in the saints, speaking of every single person that has the Lord, right? We are all saints. Sainthood is not something that you achieve when you have fed 5,000 people with bread, right? Sainthood is something in, in, in the hood, that hood word sounds weird, but being a saint is just being a child of God, right? That's all that that is, the saints, uh, ch children of God. Um, but here... Uh, here, what, he, what he's actually saying there, he says, I, I don't know everything. So therefore, it's not only even just my faith that I live by, 
right? But it's also the faith of others that encourage me. So why is it that the church is here, right? So you don't have to just live by just what you know, but the church can be a help to you. People in the congregation can be a help one to another. But the only way, listen, the only way that I can help you and the only way that you can help one another and the only way that you guys can help me is how? Is if we all have faith in the same atonement. If we all put our faith in the same Jesus, right? Let me, let me show you something else. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and I'll tell you the verse in a second. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 9, I think. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 9. Uh, so this, well, look at verse number 8. It says, then Peter, and we're reading from the King James Version, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined by the good deeds done uh, to the impotent man, by what means he has been made whole. Uh, let me read verse 9 again. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he has made whole. I'll just translate that to you real quick. I'll paraphrase it. All he's saying is if, we, if you are examining us or looking at us, by what power this man has been made well. So he was a man that was sick. But watch this. If we can go there, uh, Andre, this is the Young's Literal. And, and I, I want you to see, because the word is interesting. In, in, in verse number 9, verse number 9, Acts 4, 9, in the Young's Literal says, If we today are examined concerning the good deed to the ailing man by whom he has been saved. Right? Now, obviously, this man that was sick did not just get Jesus. That's not what happened there, right? He didn't get Jesus, but it says that he was saved. Now, this is th the reason why I had to turn to a literal translation is because Young's literal will translate the word salvation, salvation every time, right? Which is the word sozo, right? I, no, sorry, that's not, that's not the word sozo. That, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the word that that is. That word salvation, it, it is the word sozo, sorry. So the word sozo means salvation. When, when any reference to salvation of a Christian is always the word sozo, right? There, that word whole made whole. Obviously, the man was sick. The impotent man, that's talking about his sickness, his weakness, right? The weakness of the flesh. And then it says, he, he said, by, what he's saying is, if, you, if you're examining us to understand how salvation came to this man, and, and I'm going to show you in a second, not just by the Greek translation, because if you had a Greek, a Bible that you could click on the little hole, the word hole there, you would see that that word hole is the word sozo. That means to save, deliver, protect, heal, preserve, save, do well, make whole, right? So, so what we've not understood in the church is that when we say, are you saved? Well, in what, in what context are you asking me? Are you asking me if I'm feeling good? Are you asking me if Jesus Christ is, is living in me? Are you, like, what are you asking me? But to the majority of the church, are you saved just means, do you know Jesus, right? But, but, but that's not what the word salvation means. The word salvation means is that you have received the salvation that Jesus provided you. What has he saved you from? He has saved you and delivered you, right, from the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, he has saved us from death. Jesus Christ delivered us, saved us from death. That's, that's why healing is a thing. That, that's, that, that's why, that's why uh, salvation or deliverance from a bad circumstance is a thing. That's why protection for the Christian is a thing. That's why all of these good things, good things. Listen, we, we just met a lady while we were away. And she was sharing with us how I think her son either had cancer or something. I don't remember exactly. But, but it's interesting, what I, what I thought about while I was leaving, listen to this for a second. This is a mother. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that she saved and knows the Lord, right? But whether she does or doesn't, it's not the point in this, in, in this example. But she, uh, she loves her son. And do you know what she wants for her son? The same thing every single one of you want for your children. The same thing that you want for yourself. You know what you want for yourself? Salvation. That's what you want. If your child, if you have a baby and he has a fever, you know what you want for him? Salvation. Because all that that means is you don't want him to have a fever. See, it's, it's a weird thing. There are people that don't believe in healing, but yet when their child gets sick, they don't want it. Listen, if you don't believe in healing, why would you ever give your child Tylenol? You don't believe in healing. Why would you? What, what, because we think 
that healing is like the spooky, wooky thing that, that, you know, some weird things happen and people that don't know anything that are just foolish in their thinking think that they could, that a child can just miraculously made well. But, but the thing is, it's not foolish and it's not baseless, right? In other words, what, what Christianity is based on is the reason why I can lay hands on my child and I can see them recover or lay hands on anyone and see them recover. It's not because of a power that I have in my hands. It's because of the one that is in me that died to save me. When you say you're saved, you are sozoed, right? You've been saved. What that means is you have received what he's provided for you. You cannot have power over sickness and disease in this five minutes, but then over here be lacking it completely. The same people, see, there are people that believe in healing. They believe that they, have, they don't know why they can be healed. They believe in that because they've seen it happen, right? So they say, oh, yeah, I believe in healing. Why? Well, I, I saw it. I mean, in our church, people get prayed for all the time, and you see people healed, and they couldn't hear before, and now they can hear. But I don't believe in, in healing because I saw a deaf person that could hear. I believe in healing because I know he provided it for me. I'm not waiting to see to know. Jesus said live by faith, not by sight, right? You don't come to faith because you see with your physical eyes, right? Anybody can see anything happen, and people will reason that away to something else, right? But faith in Jesus is faith in Jesus. In other words, it's seeing, it's a perception. Seeing by faith is seeing, right? So here when he says, if I can bring you back to it again, in verse number nine it says, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means uh, he, has, he has been made whole, that word whole there in the King James Version is the word so. So he said, he said sozo, which means salvation. He says, be it known. Now, keep this in your mind because as I'm showing you this, when we keep reading, you're gonna see, oh, Look at it right there. It says it right there. Watch. If you didn't know, because some people think, oh, if you don't have a Bible that doesn't show you the word sozo, you can never know that. That's not true. You don't learn that because you have a Greek and Hebrew lexicon. You learn truth by listening to Jesus, right? So, so, so let's say, for instance, let's say the, the, these lexicons never existed. I can't hit that word whole and know that the translator translated salvation, in this case, as whole instead of just salvation, right? But watch verse 10. If you didn't know that and you said, oh, you read verse number nine. Oh, they're being persecuted because a man that was sick is now better. Let's say that's all you knew. Verse 10 says, be it known unto you all. They're explaining, right? This is, this is, this is uh, I believe it's Peter talking, but he says, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Now, now watch. So he's, he elaborates a little bit more. What he's saying is this healing right if let's say that's all that it was it is in reference to healing but let's say it was just that it was just the word healing and we didn't know it was salvation he, he's making reference to the only reason why this man was whole is because of jesus right that's it so you know that not not peter not any not any man there is no man no man that inherently has the power to heal another man right no and i should say it like this no one without jesus can just make and give life right because life is only found in Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the only way, listen to this, please. The only way a person can receive life to themselves or give life to another, right, is through faith in Jesus because he, life is only in him. Right? There's life in no other, and, and we'll, we'll get to even something better. Verse number 11 says, this is the stone, speaking of Jesus, which was set to naught of you builders, right, uh, which is become the head of the corner or the chief cornerstone, some translations say. Verse number 12 says, neither, watch now, neither is there salvation. It, now, I, I, that word there, salvation, is also soteria. But what he's saying is there is neither salvation in any other, for the, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved sozo right so what he's saying listen to what he's saying there he uses the word healing the word whole synonymously right in those verses with the word salvation and saved so so here's what he's saying there has been no name 
And this is so important because the name is not Joyce Meyer and the name is not Benny Hinn and the name is not Pastor Jose or Pastor Mike, right? He said there is no name that has been given to men. This is God saying this, right? He inspired the writers of the book of Acts to write these things down. And he said there has been no name, in other words, no knowledge of a man, no knowledge of a person, I should say. There has been no knowledge of a man, no name given under heaven. In other words, under God's heaven, there has been no name given to men whereby men can receive salvation, receive healing, receive wholeness, receive anything from God. There is no name, not in the name of John Wesley, not in the name of Smith Wigglesworth, there is no name. The demon looked at him and said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but you I don't know. And those demons ravaged that man. Why? Because demons don't listen to anybody but Jesus. There is no one that has been given dominion over all principality and power in, in dominion in this world or in the world to come than Jesus. And we have been seated with him in heavenly places. Therefore, we have the same authority that Christ has here on this earth. So he, we have been set above powers and principalities. But it's not because of us. It's because of him. So the reason why Paul could cast out a demon is the same reason you can cast out a demon because we have what? Faith or salvation or deliverance, right? You have been delivered from demons. Demons have no power over you, right? There are still people that are still trying to figure out if a person that is saved can be demon-possessed. Well, that's a real simple thing, right? If you know what salvation is, you would know the answer to that. But since you don't know what salvation is, right? Since you don't know that salvation is deliverance from this evil present age, since you don't know that salvation means that you have been set above all principality, power, and dominion in this world and in the world to come, since people don't know that, they, don't, they still wonder, right, if they can lose their salvation. They can st- and that's funny, right, when we say that right there, lose their salvation, so it's like, it's like everything that God has freely given you and put on the inside of you, like you can lose that. You know why? Because to people, losing their salvation means going to heaven or not. So what they mean is, can you, can you do something throughout your track on this earth that you can do something bad enough where God says, see, no, now you're not going. Nope, nothing for you, right? But that's not how, salvation is not that. When you receive salvation, what have you received? Everything that God has freely given you. In other words, everything that he did, that he freely now gives to you. And, and, and you've seen examples here. It's about a sick person. In the book of Philippians, it was about Paul being in house arrest. Everything was going to work out for his benefit. Every, that, that's why in Romans, it says that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Why? Because you're saved you understand that if, if you were not saved, you could not cast a demon out. Casting a demon out means that you speak to a demonic power and it has to listen to you. It has to obey you, right? But you have no authority. No, nobody has to obey anything that you say if you are not what? Saved, which means delivered out of this world. If you were of this world, the Bible says that if you're of this world, the world listens to its own, right? So in other words, there is no person that is not of Christ, that is not of God, right? There is no person that is not godly, not of God, right? Godly does not mean that you always wear a tie and a white shirt and do everything right and never get your hands dirty, right? Godly means you are of him, right? If I'm godly, that means I'm of God. doesn't mean I do everything right. It means I'm of him. It means I have the power in me to righteousness. I have the power in me to do everything right, but it doesn't mean that I do everything right today because I don't know everything, right? But as I grow in knowledge and as I pray for you and as you pray for me and as we encourage one another and as we speak Pray, right, as we speak the right things one to another, right? If somebody asks you to pray, then what do you do? You speak to them the truth, the truth that contradicts what they're going through, right? That's all prayer is, the truth that contradicts what's wrong in your thinking. So if somebody says, hey, can you pray for me because I'm not feeling well, you, you, you say things with the knowledge, right, because you don't have to say, I believe that Jesus Christ took my sickness and my disease and that he delivered me from all ailments and that by his stripes I'm healed. You could say all that, but you could also speak in the knowledge of that, right? You could speak in the knowledge of that. You don't have to say to a demon, listen, demon, Jesus has given me authority and power over you because he died on the cross and he has taken me out of this world and he has given me all authority over all things and I am a master of the universe and all this stuff. You don't have to say all of that. You can say, get out. That's it. But you're speaking or praying in the knowledge of what? Of what you know. 
Elijah prayed that it would not rain, rain, right, for three years, right, and it did not. But but if you see what he did, he just said to the king, he said, it's not going to rain until I say so. It's going it's to stop raining right now, and it will not rain again until I speak the word, right? But obviously, it wasn't by his power that the rain had stopped. It was by the power of God. So it's not about, it's not about everything that you say. It's about what you know. It's about what you know. It's not key words. It's not Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, whatever that is, right, saying specific things that if you say a mantra in a certain order, hocus pocus, whatever, and then it works, right? It's not key words, right? Prayers are not key words. Prayer is you speaking out of the abundance of your heart. Prayer that works is prayer that comes from a renewed mind. Prayer that does not work is prayer that comes from your brain that's not renewed. So if you ever wonder why is it that some prayer works and some doesn't, for the same reason that you do some things right and some things wrong. That's why prayer works sometimes and sometimes it don't, because you don't know everything. So because you don't know everything, you're going to say some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Therefore, some things are going to work and some things won't. Right? Can, you, can you receive all things from God? In other words, can you be protected from everything? Right? Yes, you have in you the power to be protected from every accident, from every sickness, from every disease. But then somebody that wants to speak down to you say, well, that's not true because didn't you just get sick last, last week? Well, yeah, well, I don't know everything. And if my mind was completely renewed, I would be receiving fully. But today I receive in part. Why? Because I know in part. But that's why we continue to grow. Right? We continue to grow. So that's why you've always seen in the history of all the church from the day it was established by the Lord, right? You always see things all throughout Scripture, all in people's lives. You always see hit and miss. But you know why? Because people's thinking is hit and miss. Everyone's thinking is hit and miss that way. But, but now let's read verse number 12 again. Verse number 12. Neither is there salvation. Listen, in, in, in this in this example it says neither is there healing right it was an impotent man that was healed neither is there healing in any other neither is there deliverance from imprisonment or persecution neither is there deliverance from demons neither is there salvation in any other do do you hear that with me what he's saying there is salvation in no one else other than jesus right and you know how people hold up things that said jesus saves it should say jesus saved Not Jesus saves, Jesus saved, right? Because he doesn't save us today, he already saved us. I'm accepting what he did. I'm not, he's not saving me today, right? He saved me. 2,000 years ago, he saved me. I'm receiving now the inheritance that he has put in me, which is, you ever wonder why it is? Because we talk about in Ephesians, it talks about the inheritance that's in the saints, that we would all come and understand the riches of the glory of the inheritance that's in the saints, but then the funny thing is, you also, you also read the Lord wrote, he says that we should work out, work out, work out. He's not talking about work out, right? He's talking about work out our salvation, our salvation. Isn't that interesting wording? Work out our salvation in fear and trouble. So you're saying that I have salvation in me? Yes, right? Salvation, the power to wealth, the power to healing, the power of God it's called. The power of God it's called. People are very confused. I believe that God can heal me, but I don't really believe the power of wealth is on the inside of me. Well, the Lord said, when you have built homes, right? When you have built, when everything that you have has multiplied, don't forget that it is I that have given you the power to get wealth, right? God doesn't give you green money, right? God gives you the power to prosper, right? You prosper. In other words, regardless of the circumstance, whether you just came out of a pit and you were made a slave like Joseph, or whether you are in a country that's a third world country, God makes you to prosper. Whether you're in the wilderness and got no money, no McDonald's, no Wendy's, God makes you to prosper. Even in the wilderness, even in a desert, God makes you to prosper, right? Even if your clothes, right, or most people's clothing wears thin and wears out, God can make you everything that you have to prosper. Why? Because you've been given the power of God on the inside of you, which is the power to all of these things. So there is salvation in no other, in no other. So you see how simple he's made it? The Lord says, listen to me, whatever it is that you need, that's why Jesus said, ask in my name and I will do it. Why? Because he's saying you'll have, he said in John 14, he said, me and my father will come and make our abode in you. Everything that you do, that you walk, right? He says, if you live by the spirit, I said before, therefore, walk in the Spirit. Live by whose Spirit? You don't have Casper the Friendly Ghost in you, right? Who, who is the Spirit that you have in you? 
He said, if you live by the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. He's talking about his Spirit, right? He said, the Spirit of God, it's called, or the Spirit of Christ, he's called, right? You have the Spirit of the Father and the Son living in you. That's how we're one with them. You have the Spirit of the Father and the Son living on the inside of you. So we have salvation in us, and it gets worked outwardly, right? It gets worked out. Salvation getting worked outwardly. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But you, you know how cool this is? There is? So there is no name by which people can receive healing. So does that mean, let me ask you a question then. Can you be healed just because then? Healed, right? Like, just because. You don't know. God, God is just in heaven sitting on his lounge chair, and he's like, you know what? Oh, man. Look at, look at Jose. Let's make him well today. You know, he, he did so good yesterday. Let's make him well. What's missing there? There is salvation in no other. Salvation come. There is no other name that God has given under heaven. Under heaven, which is all of the heavens, Right? Not the, not the, not, not the, name, the God, the, the heaven of God, right? But on the heaven and the earth, there is no other way that men can receive anything from God other than through the name of Jesus Christ, which name obviously means the knowledge of Christ. Name does not mean if I say Jesus Christ, right? Because people say Jesus Christ in movies all the time, and you don't see miracles happening in Hollywood, right? It's not how it works. It's not Jesus Christ. People say they stub the toe and they say Jesus Christ. It's not that, oh, it, because you say Jesus Christ, now your toe doesn't hurt anymore. Now, if you were saying Jesus Christ with the knowledge of what he did, can your toe be healed? Yes, but it's not words, right? It's not words don't heal. It's the knowledge of Christ behind what you're saying. It's the prayer does not heal. It's the prayer of faith that heals, right? Why? Because it's, there is salvation or healing or deliverance only in who? Only in Jesus. So when you think, you know what, Lord, can you just heal people like randomly, like this one and that one and not this one and not that one, people get mad at God, right? Because they, God did not heal their grandmother. But the question is not, Lord, you didn't heal my grandmother, therefore I'm mad at you. The question is, why didn't your grandmother get, in other words, why did she die? It's called lack of knowledge. That's why people die today. Lack of knowledge. Why do Christians get sick? Lack of knowledge. Why do, why do Christians get protected from an accident here and not here? Lack of knowledge. In other words, we don't know. <laughs> you don't know. And obviously, you can see the confusion in the church. Some believe in healing, some don't. Some believe in protection, some don't. Some believe that, that, that they could receive a word of wisdom, some don't. Some believe in the laying hands of the sick, some don't. Some believe, some believe that you can, you can put your hands on someone and they can, they, you can pray with them and they can be saved and receive the Spirit of God. Some don't. But So obviously, you see the disconnect in the church, right? We are, are not of the same mind and we do not speak the same thing. So because we don't think the same and we don't speak the same, then that's why you see a disconnect across the church. But, but what, what was it that Paul always encouraged it to all, in all of the letters to all of the churches that he wrote? to the Corinthians, to the Philippians, to the Ephesians, right? To, the, to those in, in Colas, right? He's always said the same thing. He said to them what? He said that we would be of the same mind and that we would speak the same thing, right? That we would be of the same mind and we would speak the same thing, right? That we would all speak according to faith in Jesus. You know what? We'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. I think one of the most important things, one of the most important things that I think if we can take away from today is Whenever you wonder, you know, as you have questions, as you get used to the gospel, you know what you'll know? You, you'll say something is going on, and you'll say, Lord, here, here's an awesome prayer, or here is an awesome thing to say, right? Because people think the only way you can pray is, pray is on your knees, right? You, you're just talking to God, and you say, Lord, you know what? This thing is going on with me. What is it that you can teach me that I don't know? Like, teach me. The way your salvation is worked outwardly is through teaching. If, you, if you've listened to Pastor Mike's message on the temple and, and, and where the oracle is, right, the place of conversation, if, you, if, you, if you've listened to where the candelabras are, where the light is in the temple and how it shines into the heart, right, into the mind, you see that it's, he's te teaching you, right? God teaches you so you can take advantage of what he's given. Jesus said this to, to the, the disciples, and it, it's so good. He said, you know what? Go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Now, he didn't say that because he knew that they were mere men. He said that to them because he knew that it would happen through them. And you know what he said to them right after that? 
Right after he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, he said to them, to them this, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. You know what the church doesn't really know today? What we have received. Therefore, you know what we're really confused about? What we can give. Because if you don't know it, you have it. But if you don't know it, how can you give it out? How can, how can he, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. If you don't know what you have, how do you know you can give it? You don't know. So that's why you see such, such, uh, such, such diversity in, in a bad way within the body of Christ. In other words, diverse ways of thinking instead of a united way to think according to the gospel. So, Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, for the thing, Lord, that at every single age, it doesn't matter, Lord, how old we are listening to this today. Lord, but we, we could be having a problem today just concerned about um, you know what? Stop there for a second. Stop there for a second. And you can leave the lights like that if you want. You know, there was one thing, and I just want to talk to you, and it doesn't have to just be kids because, you know, young people are not the only ones that have this. But, you know, I, I was in a lot of ways when I was very young, I would get tormented. It just, to me, just meant I, I would go through pieces of time just really, really sad and, and I don't know why it would happen like that, but you know what one of my greatest fears when I was a, a, a kid was? That I would lose my mom and dad. And I mean, I'm telling you, it may have been extreme and maybe it was just me, but like I would get up crying, like crying. And I was a big boy, right? I, I was older already, but crying just because I was thinking about, you know, my mom that I love so much and my dad that I love so much that something would happen to them. But, but so, you know, because we're seven years old or because we're 70 years old or 700 years old it's not you know fears and concerns and things in our mind it's just wrong ways to think it's not like wrong thinking is cute because they're eight right wrong thinking is bad even if they're a newborn it's bad right wrong thinking is bad if a child doesn't even know how to talk it's not good right wrong when, when you see a child having a tantrum that's not a good thing. That's how, oh, it's so cute. Look, he's having a tantrum. No, it's not cute. It comes from wrong thinking. That child was born with a sinful nature. He was born that way. He didn't ask for it. He was just born that way. So we teach our children, right, at every single age that our kids are at, and we teach them the same thing God is teaching us, right? We, we, we are in a church, and we have one another to do what? To share with one another. Your children were given to you not because God wants you to have power over somebody so you can feel like you're Mr. Big Man, that you have power over people, because you actually, there come a day when you will, where they'll be, they can be stronger than even you are, right? So it's not about strength and power. It's about that God, right? If you are a believer and you have a child, what God wants you to do is to instruct those children in the way of the Lord. In other words, help them to know what you know and what you don't know, let somebody else teach them, right? In other words, let them grow up knowing God. Let them grow up knowing that, you know what, I don't have to be afraid that I'm going to lose my mom and dad because I, I heard, you know, I, I heard my mom teach me, I heard my dad teach me, I heard my Sunday school uh, teacher teach me that, I, that the Lord will never leave me and never forsake me. That, that, that you know what, that I can be, imagine if I would have known this, that I could be six years old and that me at six years old could pray for my mom and dad for their protection, that my dad could have a dangerous job and I could pray for his protection and believe that at six years old, my dad would be protected because I have faith in Jesus in the salvation. That he, in other words, that I could pray for the salvation of my dad, that I could pray for the salvation of my mom, that I could pray for my own salvation, right? That, you know, people say, oh, don't worry. Kids are always going to get scrapes and they're going to get all cut up and they're going to, bad things are going to happen to them. But don't worry, I made it through too. But that's a bad way of thinking. You don't have to, do you want your kids to be bloodied up? Do you want them to get cut? Do you want them to suffer? Like, what, what kind of weird way? You, you have to be some kind of distraught mother and father to, like, desire those things upon you. That story that I was telling you about that woman that we met, that she, she wanted salvation for her child, but that's the same thing I wanted for my kids when they were little. That's the same thing that I want for you all, and that's the same thing that I want for my family today. Salvation for them. I want them to be delivered always from everything. You know the good news is? They've already been saved. So I don't have to live at six, seven, eight years old or at any age with fear, fear about losing my job. Fear about what I'm going to be. I remember Michael coming to me when he was just finishing high school. He said he would have 
night after night after night. You know what the humongous concern he had was? I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Like, I don't know what I want to do now. What 18-year-old knows what? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what they, what they, they may know what they want to do, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it. If somebody tells you, oh, don't worry, you just set your mind to it and you'll be able to do it, that's a lie. That's a lie. People have set their minds on all kinds of stuff and it does not happen just because you put your mind on it, right? That's a lie to tell your kids. Don't tell your kids, you just set your mind on to it and you'll just do it, right? Because you're lying to them. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth that it's only through faith in Jesus that you can be saved and delivered and prosper in everything that you do. You want your kids to prosper when they're adults? Teach them Jesus Christ and he'll prosper them. It's not because they go to the right school that they prosper. It's not because they go to the right university that they prosper. It's because they know the Savior is why they prosper. There's plenty of people frying fish under a bridge, I heard a man say, right, that have a doctorate and don't have two nickels to rub together. It is not about education. The United States and many other nations believe that it's only through education that you prosper. I'm telling you that it's only through Jesus that you prosper. And it's not an excuse to be lazy and not go to school. It's, an ex- it's not an excuse to not know nothing. It's an excuse to say, you know what, Lord, I want you to teach me. And I want you to show me what, where it is that, that you, that you what, what thing is it, what opportunities do you bring in front of me? What is it a good thing for you? And allow somebody that lives by the Spirit to walk by the Spirit. And you know what? If at 18 they don't know, that's okay. Then they don't know, right? You want them to get a job? You want them to be productive? Then go work. Fine. You ain't going to sit around my house eating snacks on the couch, right? Go do something then, right? Be productive. And then when you figure it out, mom and dad will help you. But to, to put pressure on our kids, right? whether it be sports, whether it be ballet, whether it be whatever, most kids aren't going to be ballerinas, right? Most kids are not going to excel that way, right? But, but that's why, listen, you, you raise them in the way that should go, right? You let them have fun, but you teach them Jesus, right? You teach them the Lord. And, and, and as you kids that are here, to be able to know I don't have to live with fear, I, 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 can, I can know that the, the, what I know about Jesus Christ can make a difference in my life. And you know what? It'll make a difference in your parents' life. You can pray for your church, right? You can pray for your neighbors, right? It's not like, you know, if, if your child that's six years old goes next door and prays for your neighbor, it's not like, oh, look, it's so cute. No, it's the Spirit of God on the inside of them, right? It's not a cute thing. It's the power of God working through an individual praying for somebody else. That's all that it is. That's all it is. It's not a cute thing. It's just a thing. It's just something that can happen, right? So, so, so it's not something to marvel at. It's something to, to teach your children. You know what? The same power that mom and dad have in them is the same power you got in you. Daddy don't have more power than you got power, right? Daddy doesn't. Now, I may know Jesus more than my kids know Jesus, and that's why you may see that salvation more than you see in a child. But obviously, right, that's why we bring our kids so they can hear. That's why we teach them so that they can know. <music> 